Hi everyone, welcome to the next talk. And uh, the next speaker is going to be Lucas Bruchholzer from JKU. And he's going to be talking to us about how to verify the results of quantum circuit compilation. Take it away, Lucas. Hi there, my name is Lucas and I'm happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, my talk is going to be about how to efficiently verify the results of quantum circuit compilation flows. And since this is a compilation flow workshop, I don't have to explain to you how compilation works, but just let me take the next one to two minutes and fix some terminology and quickly go over how a conceptual algorithm is actually compiled to a target device. What you see here is an instance of Grover search for three qubits and you see the IBM Q London device coupling map on the right. And the first step that's necessary to execute this algorithm on the device is we have very limited gate sets. So the TOEFLI gate is not native to the device. We need to decompose it in a step called synthesis, which makes the circuit quite a bit larger. And it now consists of all the gates that are supported by the device. But it might not still not um, be all, not all the gates might be executable on the device because there's the coupling graph and only those qubits may interact with each other. So we need a mapping step because the connectivity is limited. And in the mapping step, we first pick some qubits, let's say the top three, and we pick an initial layout, how to assign the logical qubits to the physical ones. Then we can apply some of the gates straight away, but not all of them because for example, this C0 there's no connection between Q0 and Q2 on the device. So we need to insert a swap gate, which dynamically changes this mapping and we can apply the rest of our gates. So this circuit right now is executable on the device, but today's devices are, have a very limited fidelity and coherence time. So it's in the best of our interest to keep the circuits as short as possible. And that's why we employ optimizations. And in, in this case, we can identify groups of gates where consecutive single qubit gates are applied on the same qubit. And we can fuse those together to obtain our actual realization, which we want to execute on the device. So while it's very important that this compilation flow that takes the conceptual algorithm to the actual realization is as efficient as possible, it's also very important that it is correct meaning that the resulting circuit still realizes the intended functionality from the original algorithm. And this takes us to equivalence checking. So the goal for equivalence checking is we're given two circuits, G and G prime, and we ask ourselves, do these realize the same functionality? And conceptually, this is rather simple because each of the gates of the circuit is represented by a unitary matrix, and we can just multiply those up and obtain a system matrix U. And we can do the same thing for a second circuit, obtaining a matrix U prime, and ask ourselves, are these two matrices identical? And while conceptually simple, this quickly amounts to a pretty, um, a complex task because these matrices are actually exponential in size with, the num with respect to the number of qubits. So, a lot of work has been going towards how to efficiently solve this task. And there are straightforward techniques based on arrays. There are techniques based on Boolean satisfiability, which try to encode the problem as a set formulation and pass it to a set solver to obtain solutions. There are techniques based on rewriting for or, or tensor networks, which use template replacing rules or stuff like that. And there are decision diagrams. But all of these techniques suffer from the immense complexity of the underlying task, which has shown to be QMA complete in general. So we have to do better than that. And for the next couple of minutes, I will going to focus on decision diagrams in particular. And since many of you might not be that familiar with this type of functional representation, for quantum circuits, let's take a deeper look how decision diagrams work. So if we consider the circuit from before, the Grover's instance, then let me tell you that its unitary matrix looks like this. 
And if we want to represent this matrix as a decision diagram, we will proceed as follows. First, we split the matrix into equal subparts and create a node with four successors, each representing one of the subparts. And then we have a careful look at those subparts because essentially these two sub matrices are identical. So we don't need two successor nodes for them. We can just use one node. Additionally, there's a constant factor of one half, which we can pull out as an edge weight right here to simplify the sub matrix. Right here on the, on the left side, we see that these two matrices differ only by a constant factor of minus one. So we might pull the minus one out here and unify those nodes again. In the next step, we repeat this decomposition into sub matrices. Again, create nodes representing the sub matrices and look at carefully at them again. Right here, we again see a scenario where these differ by a factor of minus one and these two are identical, while these four are distinct. So we can unify those two on the right side and repeat the decomposition one last time until only complex numbers remain. So we have one terminal node and three stages of nodes for each of the three qubits. So this is the decision diagram representing this matrix. And these might be visualized in, in, in different ways. You might know this representation, which is recent, um, frequently seen in recent research papers, or you might see computer generated decision diagrams that look like this, where the edge weights are, the face is color coded and the thickness implies the magnitude of the edge weights. But overall, these eventually allow to efficiently represent quantum functionality and also to efficiently manipulate it. How can these decision diagrams now be used for equivalence checking? Let's consider the two circuits from before. And we just built the decision diagram for the first circuit and the decision diagram for the second circuit. And since decision diagrams offer a canonical representation for quantum functionality, if two decision diagrams are functionally equivalent, they actually share the same structure. So to conclude their equivalence, we can just compare the root nodes and in this case conclude that these circuits are indeed equivalent. But there's a problem with this approach because you need to potentially construct two very large decision diagrams. These are still exponential in the worst case. So let's, we can do better than that. And let me illustrate the general idea now. It is based on the observation that whenever you have two circuits and they are equivalent, then the inverse of the first circuit concatenated with the second circuit resembles the identity. So if we consider the circuits from before, we first need to calculate the inverse, but the inverse is easy because we can just flip around the order of gates and invert each single gate because all of the gates are reversible. And then we could proceed in a left to right fashion, multiply all the matrices and ask ourselves, is this the identity? But we're still not quite there because the first sequence of gates constructs the whole decision diagram for the inverse of G prime. But what if we start with the identity and then successively apply gates from either circuit? Let's say we apply the first gate from the right circuit and then the first gate from the left circuit. We are back at the identity. We do this again with the right circuit and the left circuit. And now we apply the Toffoli gate of the right circuit. And someone tells us, just apply the next 15 gates from the left circuit and we are back at the identity. Next, we repeat the procedure for the last remaining two gates and we end up at the identity so we can conclude that these two circuits are indeed equivalent. So what we conceptually did is we started with the identity, successively applied gates from either side in, with the goal of staying as close as possible to the identity because it is the most compact decision diagram. And the question that now naturally arises is how to choose when to apply gates from either circuit. And the idea is that the circuit G and G prime in our case, when verifying the results of compilation flows are no generic circuits. We can exploit 
the relation between the two because we know that in fact G prime is the compiled version of G. And this eventually allows us to efficiently verify compilation results. But let us take a look what we know about the compilation flow. So this is the, the picture from before. And the compilation flow presents us with three obstacles. We have the limited gate set, the limited connectivity, and the limited fidelity and coherence. And there are basically three tasks which we applied to solve these problems. And the first task was synthesis, where the Toffoli gate in the first circuit was decomposed into a sequence of bases of supported operations of the target device. And this readily tells us when we apply the Toffoli gate from the original circuit, then we should probably apply 15 gates from the second circuit. So it is rather easy to incorporate this synthesis step. And it gives us an intuition on how to go on, how to roughly go on. Next, there, there was the mapping step. And there are some quite important points here because first of all, we have an initial mapping. The gates in the second circuit might not be applied to the same qubits as they are in the first circuit. For example, this X, X gate is applied to the second qubit while it is applied to the first qubit in the compiled circuit. So we need to account for that and keep track of the mapping between logical and physical qubits. But this mapping might also change during the course of the circuit. So we actually need to dynamically change the mapping we store, or else we might end up in a situation where we apply gates from the first circuit and cannot revert back to the identity because we apply the gates in the second circuit to different qubits. And last but not least, we have an output permutation which we have to account for. So the last thing we did when compiling our circuits was we conducted optimizations. And let me go just a step back. These conditions are necessary to incorporate for the equivalence check to work. Without them, we cannot show the equivalence. So now let's turn to the optimizations. And in this case, we identified groups of gates which can be combined to one. And these have different implications on the strategy that might be used for equivalence checking. For example, here, we have an instance where the decomposition of the Toffoli gate now not only consists of 15 gates, but it's 14 gates. And that's rather easy to incorporate for because we know the decomposition and we know that this type of optimization is applied. Next, there are instances where the diffusion operator of the, of the grower search consists of 11 gates in the original circuit, but only five gates in the compiled circuit. We can account for that by simply applying all consecutive single qubit gates from the original circuit before applying one gate from the compiled circuit. And then there's instances like here where gates just cancel out. And these are potentially hard to incorporate because there's no structural correspondence anymore between this circuit and this circuit. And there are more delicate issues than just the removal of two single qubit gates. But as we will see in the results I will show you next, it's enough to account for the most basic optimizations to also achieve incredible results when using this technique on circuits that are optimized in a more enhanced fashion or are optimized further. So let's ha have a look at some numbers. We used our technique to verify results of IBM Qiskit's compilation flow. And for this, we first had a look at the optimization level 01. This is the default optimization level of IBM Qiskit. And we considered several instances of benchmarks frequently used for testing compilers, compiled them to a suitable IBM architecture. And then first, we used the technique where you build the decision diagram for the first circuit and the second circuit and you compare the root nodes. And what you see is significant runtimes. You see frequent timeouts of over an hour, and it's not feasible to conduct equivalence checking in this way for verifying compilation results. Next, 
if we consider this scheme where you successfully apply gates and you only use a very generic strategy, then we see a picture that is pretty similar. We see better run times, but still frequent timeouts and long run times. But if we now exploit explicit knowledge seen on the previous slide about the compilation flow, this allows us to verify all the circuits within a matter of seconds or even less. And let's now turn to the case where we have not directly optimized the strategy to account for everything and have a look at Qiskit's optimization level O2. Then we see a pretty similar picture. The standard technique times out frequently. The other technique is slightly better, but we are still able to verify all the results within a matter of seconds by exploiting the knowledge about the compilation flow. Although this does not incorporate all the optimizations that are applied to the circuits like gate transformation or gate resynthesis, it's still quite impressive that you can verify all those circuits. So this brings me to the end of my talk. Let me wrap up what it was all about. Our goal was to verify the results of compilation flows. So what we did was equivalence checking. And how did we do it? We did it by employing decision diagrams, which frequently allow to compactly represent and also to efficiently manipulate quantum functionality. And we did not do it in a straightforward fashion, but we employed a dedicated scheme where we start with the identity and then successively apply gates from either circuit with the goal of staying as close as possible to the identity. And for designing a strategy to conduct this scheme, we explicitly exploit the knowledge we have about the compilation flow and about the relation between G and G prime. Eventually, this allowed us to verify the results of IBM Qiskit within a matter of seconds, whereas state-of-the-art techniques time out and require substantial runtime. The proposed tool is publicly available under the link you see here. Feel free to check it out. We're happy for feedback and for questions. And if you ever want to learn more about this type of decision diagram and how it's used for simulation or verification, then also feel free to check out our installation-free web tool we recently launched for visualizing decision diagrams and how they can be employed. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm open for questions. Thanks very much, Lucas. That is a very, uh, a very stimulating talk. Uh, I don't see any questions yet in the Slack, so I will allow people to type their, their messages in there. However, that's not a problem because I have lots of questions. Go ahead. Uh, so I guess, sorry, I'm near an airport, so I'll just let that plane fly past. So I think I want to ask, firstly, a clarifying question, which is, is this... Um, is this method actually complete in the sense that it will always correctly answer the equivalence question? Yes, it will. It's just based on the observation that when you concatenate the one circuit with the inverse of the other, this if, if this shows the identity, then your both circuits are equivalent. Right, but might it say, might it fail to answer yes when they are equivalent? No, it might not. Okay, because what it basically does, it's, it's just like the question if two matrices are similar, but with a very efficient data structure. So matrices don't fail yet. Okay, okay, that's, uh, that's fine. And then the, the other obvious question, given that it's a complete procedure is, it's a QMA complete question, right? So it, it is, yeah. Under what circumstances do I actually hit the, the complexity wall? Mm, I guess you could say it, it's a QMA complete problem, but you exploit knowledge about the relation between the circuits, which makes it easier because you're not in the channel rate case where you know nothing about your circuits and about the potential structure of the circuits. 
So in, in a general case where I present you with two circuits you know nothing about and you ask the questions if these are equivalent, then it's very, very hard to design a strategy that keeps these decision diagrams close to the identity or it might be arbitrarily hard. And that's where the complexity comes from. Right, so if my, if my optimization method is sufficiently complicated, then I could eat the exponential blow up by checking the, the equivalence. This remains a question of, of open research, I guess, because right now it's, let's say, a proof of concept that it works for Qiskit and it works for, mm, for more optimizations than uh, that are accounted for. You, you could try more elaborate optimizations and see if it still works or if you can just tweak your strategy in a way that again allows you to stay close to the identity. But yes, you, you may, it may be possible to design a, a scenario where this is quite hard. And do I have the, the right intuition that if I start just with two completely random unit trees, which are definitely not equivalent or, you know, probability zero yeah. or, not, or, or, or equivalent, then I would expect to see the, the complexity blow up, the diagram yeah. become very large. Def definitely. So you would probably, depending on the number of qubits, you would also, you would already expect a single decision diagram for one of the circuits to blow up. And just imagine you take two of the circuits which are not related to each other, then there is bound to be a blow up. Okay. Well, we have a question from Seon Sivaraja who asks if you could give us a little bit more detail about how you account for the complicated um, rewrite methods. Mm -hmm. So one of the interesting techniques is, or, or one of the implications of optimizations, which are rather hard to account for, is if you imagine a swap gate and you have a C naught before it, then the swap gate is decomposed into three C naughts typically and two of the C nodes actually cancel out. So you do not see the swap in the resulting circuit. And this might lead to the fact that you apply gates from the second circuit to different qubits than you have applied them in the first circuit. And you, have, you, you can correct that afterwards, but in the meantime, the decision diagram might grow. So you can account for that by changing the, the, the template of two C nodes which have the control and target flipped after each other to a swap and a C node again. And then you can perfectly track the correct mapping in the circuit. That's, that's one instance of an optimization you can account for. And a second optimization might be the resynthesis of two qubit blocks, which is employed by Qiskit. But you can also account for that by skimming over your original circuit and just roughly estimating how many gates this decomposition will translate to. So you can, you, you can adjust how to proceed picking the gates from the, the one circuit or the other. And you, you don't have to get this perfect. So there does not have to be a perfect match between the two circuits because decision diagrams are very good in efficiently representing functionality. You just have to sort of stay away from the complete blow up. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there's still another question being typed in, but while that is, is happening, um, I might ask, so when I saw the, the method you were using to construct the diagram at the beginning of the talk, yeah. it seemed that you were basically reproducing a kind of tensor product factorization of the unitary. Is it we're, we're currently working on establishing the relation between tensor networks and decision diagrams. But we're not quite there yet. So we have basic understanding and there are certain similarities, but we're still not quite sure where the direct connection is. Okay, great. Well, I think um, we've actually totally overrun the time, probably due to me asking too many questions. <laughs> Um, so I suggest, Lucas, that you, you join the Slack channel and answer all the follow-up questions that are sure to occur there. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Very, uh, very clear and very interesting. Thanks for the invitation. Happy to be